And ladies and gentlemen, this COVID-19 slash coronavirus has impacted its will and has us with a lot of crazy things in, in, in and around our neighborhoods and our workplaces. But we're going to endeavor to ignore all of that. We're going we're gonna to plot on, regardless of the craziness that goes on, in and out of the studio. And we're going to entertain you in the rugby space. And we're going to show you an intestinal fortitude uh, not yet seen, uh, because this is like an alien disease, isn't it? We, haven't, we don't have a, uh, a manual to refer to, but the manual that we're going to refer to is doing this show despite the odds. And with that, we have an all-star cast of pundits waiting in the wings, and, and we'll, we'll get to them right after this. So don't go away. Stay with us. <laughs> hey, no, I'm not. You had you had Brian's face up for the last two segments. Not on my side, I didn't. I'm still looking at you, not me. You want me to keep going? Coming up next on Rugby Wrap Up, the COVID-19 comeback show with Steve Lewis, Dan Power, Brian Ray, and Seattle Seawolves star JP Smith. Rugby Wrap Up brought to you in part by The Pig and Whistle, the world's best rugby pub, and Lean and Limber. Stretch your way to a healthier lifestyle. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. Matt McCarthy in the epicenter of the virus, the COVID-19 virus, the Mike Petri dish of the virus, if you will. And I have uh, some esteemed guests willing to risk uh, getting this uh, infectious disease, and they are infectious guests, including Mr. Steve Lewis, who is in Manhattan, the epicenter of the disease, with yours truly. He's on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, uh, Mr. Dan Power is not in Antarctica. He is in, I believe, Denver. Dan, is that Denver, Dan? Is that right? Yeah, it's uh, just bunkering down and persevering at this point, Matt. And the man that should be dressed like that, who just took his dog sled, dog sled to his outpost, Mr. Brian Ray up in Nova Scotia. Brian, how is it up there? Is it any different? Is there anybody else around to get this uh, flu from? Uh, everybody's hibernating right now. I could have used some dog sleds to get back from work today. It was a total disaster driving. Hit by a snowstorm at the end of March. Really exciting, I tell you. Stephen, uh, you and I are in this New York City thing where it is really like post-apocalyptic, right? Uh, are you experiencing the game of chicken on a daily basis that I am, where people on the sidewalk are walking directly toward you and not observing the six feet apart social spacing thing? No, I'm up in uh, Bougieville, which is the Upper West Side. So I'm, uh, you know, the people up here are a little more cultured, a little more socially appropriate. So we, 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 uh, we observe the, uh, the boundaries that we're supposed to be observing. Ironically, you're the bougie guy, but you don't have a headset or a camera that works as well. I've got fine art on one side. I've got a book collection on the other. I'm okay. All right, fair enough. All right, let's get to the show, guys, because uh, we got a lot to get to. There's a lot going on, despite the fact that there's no rugby being played. There's a bunch of stuff going on off the pitch, starting with USA Rugby back in the news, not in a great way. Again, it's coming to a head, this pimple that needs to be popped. Steve, you're a USA congressman, a USA rugby congressman, I should say. There's been a leaked memo. There's been stuff out on the Goff report that I, my sources tell me is pretty accurate. I've spoken to some uh, deep throat individuals within the organization or organization for Brian. Uh, but Steve, walk us through what's, what's going on with the Chapter 11 or Chapter 7 and what we can expect come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. Yeah, so it's a, it's a critical time for USA Rugby. I think everyone's aware of that. Some chickens have come home to roost. Um, not at liberty to discuss everything, but um, clearly with this, this virus has impacted both USA Rugby which was undergoing a financial challenge. And it's no secret they were looking for a bailout from World Rugby. Um, unfortunately, uh, other unions are also now feeling the heat. So World Rugby doesn't just have USA Rugby cap in hand. So that's problematic. Cancellation of the high school spring season is problematic. That's uh, membership revenue that's not there. And consequently, it's uh, all hands on deck. There have been daily meetings with the board, daily phone calls with Congress, and it will come to a head uh, this weekend and very early next week. You know, there's stuff out on the internet saying that, hey, man, you can't not blame Nigel Melville and Will Chang and uh, Sternberg, David Sternberg, for all that went happen happened with RIM and everything else. But 
we did. We called them on it in one way or the other. That said, that stuff was in the rear view mirror and we had all of this in front of us and it's happened again, unfortunately, right? So it pains me to talk about this stuff. I, you know, I'm the, I'm the Forrest Gump, the, the half full guy and lying on these people to get this thing right. But also, you know, Dan, you're an eagle, right? So you understand what it's like for these guys and girls off the pitch to have this stuff happen to them. Yeah, I haven't been this confused since I found out my girlfriend's brother's my dad and my dad's sister's actually my mum. Uh, Jon Snow reference there, Game of Thrones. But yeah, it's, it's troubling, Matt. It really is. And I know Steve can't go into too much details, but you've got your sources. And, and I think most people are hearing the rumblings that bankruptcy is inevitable for USA Rugby. And it's just a matter of what number you put next to that bankruptcy chapter, you know, to be determined, I guess, is, is the answer at the moment. But the big question, I think, for the playing group is what's next? Like, what happens after bankruptcy? Most people aren't really that well-versed in, in this business side of, of rugby. We just know rugby for the, the great sport that it is. So what's next? What does the landscape for rugby in America look like after this bankruptcy? And I, big, I guess that's probably the biggest question out there for, for guys and girls like myself um, who, who aren't intimately involved with the negotiations of what happens next. Yeah. Brian, what do you think this has in terms of the Canadian effect, Rugby Canada looking at this. I mean, you know, they haven't been exactly killing it on the pitch in recent years, specifically in 15s, but the sevens team showed some promise lately. Are are there lessons to be learned or is everybody ignoring what all the other unions are doing? Well, I mean, you can see the mismanagement kind of rife all over uh, world rugby. There's a piece by Owen Jones that kind of touched on that. And certainly here north of the border, we aren't, uh, you know, safe from criticism. We've had our own uh, problems up here. I will say, though, we look at a slightly healthier financial position right now. But, you know, I kind of think in North America, we're all in this together. So it's troubling to see, uh, you know, what's going on down there. And I'm sure uh, Alan Vanson and everybody at at Rugby Canada HQ are on uh, regular calls down there to see what's going on. And and if they can help in any way, I I know we we certainly can't lend them any money. Um, So, you know, all we can do is maybe offer some advice but again we're not perfect so i'm not sure uh, how much advice we could even help them with it seems as though anytime that somebody comes in that's got some fresh ideas uh, that they're kicked down the can is kicked down the road until it's too late to implement and that that seems to be the case here there were there were plans in place that could have been used or utilized allegedly that may have come before the covid-19 thing but the covid-19 thing steve really put the nail in the coffin for that Obviously, we're going to deal with this more fully um, beginning of the week in another show when we can speak freely. But, um, you know, American rugby will continue, right? Rugby will be played. Um, It may be more regionally organized initially. Um, National teams will continue to compete. World rugby are invested in the USA having teams. The U.S. Olympic Committee is invested in the U.S. sevens teams. Um, So it's not the end of the world. Um, it may be the event that allows you know, us to clear the decks and, and set the thing up perhaps in a more rational way with more direct representation. Um, there's a lot of politics into it, but um, it's been unfortunate. Uh, but these are the cards we have dealt ourselves. And so we have to play the hand and the game will be over on Monday or Tuesday. All right, we're going to take a quick break and come back and we'll kick off with Dan Power because, Dan, you were actually part of the Eagles Sevens program. So we're going to talk Tokyo and the postponement of the Olympics right after this. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street. And we are back. Matt McCarthy with Steve Lewis, Dan Power, and Brian Ray. We, Dan, we left the audience with a cliffhanger. Not like your Game of Thrones cliffhangers, but this one is uh, pretty important for the ro- rugby folks out there. The Olympic Games are suspended. You were an Eagle. You played some sevens. Uh, you have the greatest calves in the history of the Eagle Seven squad. Yet they wouldn't be showcased in Tokyo coming this, uh, this summer. How would you feel about that if you were a player? and maybe running out of gas. Just to be perfectly clear, my USA Sevens career lasted all of about five or six days. I did one camp and then realized how much running was involved. And I actually got a phone call from the Miami Dolphins and they said, do you want to come try out as a punter? And I said to Al Caravelli, 
do you run more when you go down to the actual event and training? And he said, yes. And I said, I'm out. I'm going to Miami. Have fun down in Wellington. So uh, in terms of my sevens experience, I appreciate that. But it's not, uh, I think I'd defer to Steve. But, uh, you know, the deferment of Tokyo is kind of like the last season of Game of Thrones. Very disappointing. Um, feels like everyone was very excited. Uh, How much are you getting from Game of Thrones? I'm really bored, Matt. I'm not going to lie. I'm really, really bored. And uh, no, it, it is disappointing. I think men's and women's were really in a good position. Uh, I feel for some of the players. Steve will probably be able to touch on this a little better than I can. I just wonder what this does to a lot of squads for players who are getting close to the end of their career. Do they have another 12 months in them to start a training camp again and get ready for 2021? Uh, as you know, sports is, is a cruel mistress when it comes to the back end of your career. So I think a lot of players may have missed their window uh, on this Olympic Games dream, Matt. Cruel mistresses is a great segue into Steve Lewis going in on with his explanation of this. I say sevens is a cruel mistress, one of my favorite phrases. Um, I also have just started watching Game of Thrones. So I'm all over Dan's uh, outfit tonight and all the references. Okay, so let's, let's look at the players and the coaches because that's who it affects most uh, immediately. And not just in terms of, um, it affects their you know, pay packet potentially as well. So think about it. You've, you've prepared, you've set aside your you know, put life on hold for a couple of years. You're trained, you're ready to go. You made the team this year. You're looking good. And then boom, you got another 12 months. So the squads will change. Form will change. The whole event will be different. Um, for the USA players in particular, given the other stuff going on, it's got to be a nervous time and you've got to feel for them. They put a lot of time, coaches and players, men and women, into preparation for this thing and it ain't happening. Um, so that's disappointing. Um, I just got to bring Brian in here briefly that on whenever it was Canada pulled out on Monday, uh, just for a day there, I was actually looking forward to coaching Jamaica at the Olympics, but then <laughs> it was gone. But one day I might have been an Olympic coach. But anyway, um, it's, it's a sad thing for players and coaches and the, the deck of cards will be shuffled big time, most countries within 12 months. Injuries, age, as Dan points out. And to be honest, the USA has um, probably one of the older squads. So it's probably more of an issue for the US than other teams. Uh, but very interesting, nonetheless. Right, my intel tells me that Danny Barrett in particular will be around. He, it's, he, he's hell-bent on getting that next Olympics experience under his belt. But Brian, I thought Steve was going to compliment you as a Canadian because Canada were the leaders here in saying they weren't going. Yeah, well, I, I have to applaud them on, uh, on that decision. To be honest, it was the right decision. But at, at the same can, time... Can you actually believe that the rest of the world followed Canada? <laughs> For once, eh? <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and I think that was inevitable. I think we could all see that coming. Um, so, you know, it, that was the decision. I know some of the, the guys were, were feeling kind of heartbroken for a couple of days there, but now they know there's just a, an extra year uh, ahead. But, you know, I just want to echo what, what's been said about some of these senior players, you know, uh, especially the Canadian guys. I mean, the women are, are in great shape. They played the last Olympics. We didn't qualify at the last one, so this was their shot, and now they're kind of pushed out another year. Some of these older guys might not crack. There was whispers that John Moonlight might even uh, try and sneak in there this time. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And there's another knock-on effect. A lot of these guys, I can say for a fact, we're thinking of moving on to Major League Rugby after the Olympics this year. Maybe that's now delayed for another year too. So uh, it's, a big, uh, it's a big deal. It's going to have a big effect on the rugby world, and uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. So one, one other quick point I neglected, Matt. This now will conflict with the Women's World Cup 15s. And that, that is a real issue for um, teams, certainly like the USA, who, who tend to have players can go back and forth. So that, that is, I mean, that's a decision players are going to have to make, but it's certainly going to um, impinge on playing strength for the 7s and the 15s being as successful as they could be. You're right. You know, we're going to revisit a lot of this next week after the conference calls of Congress and the board comes up with whatever recommendations they come up with, but also the impact across the globe on all the different setups is something that is fodder for shows that can last us through not only this virus, but maybe the bubonic plague and something else. We'll, we'll be talking plagues and MLR right after this. And we 
are back, ladies and gentlemen, with Steve Lewis on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, Mr. Brian Ray in Nova Scotia, and Mr. Dan Power in on the wall somewhere between where uh, King's Crossing. It's been a while since I've watched the show, Dan. Where is that wall ex exactly? It's north of King's, King's Landing, obviously. Uh, uh, King's Cross, you may have some explaining to do to your lovely wife, Matt, for the fact you threw that one out there, but... Yeah, <laughs> north the north the wall is as north uh, as you can go before you get to the wildlings. And winter is coming, and it is certainly coming for us because, guys, the Major League Rugby 2020 season hashtag MLR 2020 has been canceled. It was previously suspended. It's canceled. There's a virtual season going on, and and none of us were affected by this, right, Steve? No comment. Dan, no, you know, we, you know, just doing some matches in the booth and stuff, maybe a little extra cash, or for some of us, the rent money. <laughs> yeah, you know, everyone's talking about the baby boom coming in nine months. What about the divorce rate? I've been stuck at home every week and my wife hates me. So, yeah, it's been tough. Oh, I, don't, I don't buy that for a second, my friend, but, uh, well, maybe, maybe a second. But, uh, Brian, you guys only had one team in Canada. So, what are you guys doing now? I mean, for, for rugby, I mean, we at least spread the pain across a lot of states. We have, well, you're the 51st state, but aside from that, what are you guys doing up in Canada for rugby talk? Uh, apparently, we're playing video games the same as everybody else. <laughs> Maybe not my cup of tea, but, uh, you know, kudos to the league for, for putting something on. I have to say, MLR is coming out of this a little bit better than I, I think some other leagues are. Uh, the way they've treated the players, both with the pay and with the virtual thing, kept people engaged. So, uh, you know, it's something anyways. Yeah, yours truly was in talks with an undisclosed network about getting rugby wrap up, the major league rugby version of it out on a, on a network in a lot of cities across the United States and slated to do some commentary on matches for the Free Jacks and uh, Rugby United New York with my beloved colleague Steve Lewis here. And within less than 48 hours, that all carpets were pulled out from under the feet. But hey, we go on. And Dan, you're a big part of how we're going on with the virtual MLR. Walk us through this, my friend. Well, I think alongside with uh, Formula Earn, as it is called in France, Formula <laughs> One, it is uh, the two sports that jumped on the virtual bandwagon. I got to tell you, Matt, it's, it's, uh, it's been fun to do with Pete Steinberg and they've got a lot of real positive press from it. I mean, Forbes and the New York Times have both covered the virtual season and it's keeping fans and players engaged. For Brian, my good friend McAdoo, Jamie McKenzie up there was outstanding in week one. A paper cut brought him to his knees yesterday in the loss. I don't know if you saw the footage, but he has a paper cut across his thumb. It's, uh, it's devastating injury blow to, to one of the talented players. But Major League Rugby's partnered up with Feeding America as well. And that's the big reason they've done this, Matt, is to help raise some money through Feeding America for these uh, you know, at-risk youth and at-risk areas during this crisis. So they're putting a, a pretty hefty donation together to go to the food banks through Feeding America to provide. I mean, I have two kids and they eat lunch at school every day. And there's a lot of kids that's for them is, is their major source of uh, nutrition is their lunches and, and school lunches. So you take that out of the equation and it's, it's a big deficit for their parents who, who are pretty you know tight on, on their budget anyway to make up. So it's, it's a great cause and it's been good fun to do with Pete and it's good to see MLR kind of at the forefront with that virtual season as well, Matt. Yeah, it's great to see the positive out of the negative. In the meantime, you can see J.P. Smith of the Seattle Seawolves trying to figure out how to get on this call. You can tell us about his performance, Dan, which has been suspect in the virtual MLR with Brad Tucker as his coach. Yeah, his performance was the COVID-19 off uh, virtual rugby. It was so bad. I mean... Uh, that's what happens probably when you're a full-time professional rugby player. You're training and playing. You don't have time. Or maybe that's a generational thing, Steve. I don't know what you looked at. the video game. Thing. <laughs> yeah, Steve, what's it going to take to win you over on this? And I think we all know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're going with that. Um, no, look, anything that maintains any kind of fan engagement is a good thing. So hope everyone enjoys it. They raise some money. It's a good cause. All right, fair enough. I think they missed the boat, Dan, on not having Rooney as Ireland. You got the arrows are 
uh, the arrows of Canada, right, Brian? That's right. I got that one right, at least. And was that literally part of the lottery or? The Toronto Arrows. Come on. It, it, we'll be playing as. Or was that, you know. Canada. It looked pretty good, ball. <laughs> Reaching it. Oh, coincidentally, Toronto is Canada. I mean, come on. Wait a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, we are being joined by J.P. Smith of the Seattle Seawolves. J.P., your ears must be ringing because we were burying you. Uh, quite frankly, because of your your uh, performance lackluster, it was it was figuratively, actually, and literally awful. You yeah, know, look, uh, there's there's obviously there, there's been times, uh, you know, in my career that you know you have to take responsibility for something, and today I just want to say that we blame everything on Brad Tucker. <laughs> Um, poor, very, very, very poor performance from Brad tonight. Um, obviously, last week's performance, there's lots of things that, that came into play. You know, we can talk about the refs and all of that. But, uh, yeah, it was just uh, out and out. I don't think it was our, our day today. Um, yeah, and like I, wanna, like I say, I just want to say I want to apologize to the fans, to the players of the Seawolves too, because, you know, that is, that is a disgrace. Uh, is there anything that you would do differently, uh, JP? Is there anything that you're working on to, to to try to correct this? Because you guys, you guys need wins. Yeah, we definitely do need wins, and it's difficult because, <laughs> because if we have a guy like Brad Tucker holding a controller, um, there's only one way that scoreboard's going to go, you know. So uh, I, I think I think the boys should just start training a little bit more, practicing rather than training. Um, just keep playing the game. Uh, the more you play it, the better you'll get at it. And I just don't think that either of us have, have done really well doing that. All right. We are basically running out of time. We've got about eight minutes left in the studio before the virtual studio before they boot us out. But JP, uh, we all kidding aside, real bummer for you guys. Uh, it's a bummer for us. It's got to be 10 times the bummer for you guys not being able to actually go out there instead of just BSing about it. Yeah. And acting like we know what we're talking about. What's, what's the feeling for you guys? in Seattle right now because you, you didn't get out to the start that you wanted. You probably have a, a not the greatest taste in your mouth from that. And you guys were all starting to come together. Players were getting there. Injuries were starting to heal. What's the feeling? Yeah, it was, like, it's very, it's a, like you say, it's really hard for the players. Um, I think everyone was looking forward to the season of the MLR. Like everyone knew that, you know, just, from last year to this year, there was there's big changes that 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 were made. You know, all the teams were better. Um, you look at the signings that came in this year from all the other teams, and it was just for us. I think obviously, come, like coming off the first few games, we just couldn't get our rhythm. We just we we really weren't in a good spot. Um, and then the sort of the last two, two games, we 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 sort of like got down as a team or got together as a team, and we just decided, you know, this this has got to go one way, and, and it has to go up. So. Um, you know, we, we worked harder, we trained harder, we, you know, we, we, we put a lot of work in, into two weeks of, of training. And it was just like, like you say, it's a bummer. It's, it's just, you know, the guys were, were sort of like starting to become positive because everything was, was starting to look a little bit better. We, our, our shapes on the field were starting to look a little bit better. But yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. You know, there's, it's... It, it's obviously something much bigger than rugby, and that's that's one thing that you got to remember, is that you as a player or you as a team is never bigger than the game. So, yeah, it's a tough one. Any unrest in the locker room? Because you know, season one, the the, the word on the street was that you guys were without a coach, and you were like literally getting in fistfights, and then won the the plate, and then won it again. Is there harmony? Is it what what's going on? I know it's tough to talk to, but. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't here for the first year when when the Seawolves started, but when I when I did come in in uh, last year, you know, I, one thing that I did realize is when the times got tough, I think everyone started sticking together, and that's where where, where the Seawolves actually started growing a lot more as a team. Is when 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 things did get a little bit tough and things didn't go our way, I think that's when we grew the most as a team and we came closer together, and you know, uh, it was more or less all just for the team, and there's no one man show all of that. I'm also responsible for this is you expect a lot of things as a player because I mean if you look at the first two years they had it they didn't have it easy they didn't have coaches we struggled last year with coaches and all that we can blame all of those excuses but at the end of the day the boys pulled together and, and you know we managed to sneak it away and I think this year there were a lot of people you know just 
expecting that it's going to go the same way and it never does. You need to work hard and you need to just stay humble and, and keep crafting and that's the way rugby is. Well, you, uh, I've met you in person. I've had the pleasure. Uh, I was at one of your games, I think the home opener last season in Seattle, and then watched you win the championship and was down on the pitch. You guys have a great organization. you got great talent. I don't doubt that you're going to bounce back. But before we run out of town, I want to turn it over to the guys. Guys, 30 seconds each. Do you have a question for JP, Steve? Scrum half, he's six foot one, for God's sakes. And gorgeous. <laughs> no comment. Um... I think as, as players, I think um, you guys should appreciate, or and I think you do, that MLR has agreed to keep p- paying players in full. Uh, in comparison, in contrast with some other leagues, um, every, pretty much every other league, um, players are taking haircuts and salary cuts. Yeah. I know the amounts aren't as big, but um, as a player, I hope that gives you some comfort that, um, that the league has done the right thing. Yeah, no, 100%. I think... There's no better way f- for the league to have treated us in this time. I mean, like I've got some mates in, in playing in the UK at, at Sale Shocks, and you know the guys back in South Africa, and they they all taking salary cuts at the moment. Uh, there's obviously like lots of different aspects of it, but um, w- one thing that I must admit, and I've said it to a lot of people at the Seawolves, like all my friends and all of that, is that it, it, it's one way to keep the guys here, you know, to keep the guys actually th- to, to let them make them see that you know the MLR is here, and you know. Players are getting looked after. Um, it's a great league. The, the people working, working like behind the scenes and all of that. You know, it, the systems are in place. That's what I. That, that's what I want to get to is that the systems are in place. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very grateful that that um, that they did decide to pay us all our money because um, I know there's a lot of people that that would have been stuck in a different situation. You know, don't know none of them here. None of them on this call. Dan, a question for uh, Mr. Smith. Hey Juan, Dan, how you doing, mate? Nice, yeah, all good. Hey, not not really a question, more of a statement in terms of your performance for uh, virtual rugby. You've been dubbed the Millie Vanilli of our generation, a fake, an imposter, uh, a loser uh, to go that far. Not my words, the the people's words. How do you respond to the public, you know, dubbing you this? Yeah, Dan, just like I said earlier, there's obviously. You know, a lot of the times you've got to take responsibility in life. But for this one, I'm going to shift all the, all, all the blame to, to Brad Tucker. Yeah, uh, blame it on Tucker. It's, yeah, just blame everything on him, you know. Like that, that guy holding a remote controller in his hand looks like Rickard just gave him line-out calls and he just doesn't know what's going on, like it usually is. Hashtag blame it on Tucker. Brian Ray, you got a question before we end this thing? Uh, JP, a uh, two-time uh, defending champions of the Shield. I'm assuming you guys actually still have the Shield in Seattle. Have you guys been fielding any uh, requests, so to speak, from San Diego, trying to take that away from you, even though there wasn't an actual uh, championship final this year? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure how well that's going to go with our owners. They can definitely re- request it. I, I think we do still have the Shield over here. I think it's in our, you know, sort of in the office in a, this place, Dan. So sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some, and luckily the Shield is here. All right, gentlemen, just like that, we are out of time. But I got to thank you all for coming on. We're going to do this again. Mr. Steve Lewis, Mr. Dan Power, Mr. Brian Ray, and Mr. J.P. Smith. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Matt McCarthy, on behalf of all these gentlemen, for Rugby Wrap-Up in Midtown Manhattan, damn the COVID-19 virus, signing off. Please hit that YouTube subscribe button, follow us on all social media platforms, and sign up for our weekly newsletter.